Hello, and uh, thanks for joining us for this uh, Richard M. Karp Distinguished Lecture. My name is Peter Bartlett. I'm the Associate Director of the uh, Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing. Um, we established the RM Karp series to celebrate the pioneering role of uh, Simons Institute founding director Dick Karp in theoretical computer science. And we're grateful to the many contributors to the Richard M. Karp Fund who've made this series possible. Uh, the series features visionary leaders in the field of theoretical computer science on topics associated with current programs at the Institute. Uh, and it's geared towards a broad scientific audience. And this semester, the Institute's hosting, hosting uh, two programs, one on learning and games and one on causality. And I'm delighted to welcome our speaker today, Professor Ava Tarosh, who's one of the organizers of the program on, on learning and games. So Ava is the Jacob Gould Sherman Professor of Computer Science at Cornell University, uh, where she's currently serving a second term as chair of uh, the Department of Computer Science. She's also served as Interim Dean for Computing and Information Sciences and as Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, Ava received her degrees from Erdfurst University in Budapest. Uh, her research interests are in algorithms and the interface of algorithms and incentives. And she's perhaps best known for her work on network flow algorithms and for quantifying the efficiency of selfish routing. Uh, she's the co-author of the widely used textbook, Algorithm Design, and the recipient of many fellowships and awards, including the Packard Fellowship, uh, the Girdle Prize, the Danzig Prize, the Fulkerson Prize, the EATCS Award, and the IEEE von Neumann Medal. And she's been elected to the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Her talk today is titled Stability and Learning in Repeated Games. Please join me in welcoming Eva Tarosz. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I guess I have to start with the sort of awkward question that I'm very unsure about the masking etiquette here. Uh, I guess I thought, Peter, I was thinking of using the Cornell rule of masking, where Cornell currently says that the speaker should not be masked because that way it's easier to understand and anyway there is a distance while we require our students to mask. Uh, if anyone is uncomfortable with the fact that I'm not masked, I uh, do have a mask, so just let me know and I can change my strategy. But I figured speaking with an accent, you probably, uh, I'm better off if I'm not masking. Uh, the second point is that I understand that this is a very uh, diverse and interesting audience consisting of people in our program on learning and games who might have seen a lot of what I'm talking about. And many of you who are not from those programs or haven't seen, or maybe haven't seen it even though you were from that program. So what I'm trying to do is both give you a bit of background of what is it that I'm, we are trying to, or I'm trying to work on and a little bit of how do we do what we do. Uh, you can definitely control, like sort of slow me down or speed me up by asking the right kind of questions. And I very welcome uh, uh, audience interactions. So please, uh, you know, ask questions or interrupt. So what I want to talk about is, is uh, interesting questions and learning in, in repeated games and to start with sort of the really uh, distant interaction, interest in this, um, you know, for the last, at this point, well over 20 or maybe 30 years, many of us have thought about interaction, selfish interactions of multiple agents uh, and asked the questions of, what kind of outcome should we expect? And, and this price of energy question, that is how good are these outcomes that, that players achieve as they interact with each other. Uh, what I want to uh, talk about today is, is uh, more focusing on um, interactions which are repeated. Like it's not a one shot, you play the game, it's over, you got the reward and you're done. But something that, that these participants participate over and over again. And in particular, the main message is this line here, where in many of those interactions, the natural form that people do is somehow take the observation of what's happening in the game as they're playing it and using it to figure out what to do next. That is, they use some sort of learning algorithm to, um, learn what to do in this situation. Uh, there are many great questions one can ask here uh, from um, which I'm going to maybe get to or maybe just hint at. 
uh, what do I mean by learning? So what's the right depth? What does it mean that they learned? What do they learn from data? From, from data? What are uh, forms of learning that guarantees that something decent happens in, as an outcome? And um, generally, what can we say about outcomes in learning? To get you started, a couple of sort of my favorite applications here. Uh, I guess the all time favorite, the one I, Peter mentioned that maybe uh, I'm most known for is traffic routing with delays. Traffic can be car traffic or uh, internet traffic, uh, whether it's a car and you're driving someplace every, every morning or whether it's internet traffic and the routers are actually doing the routing for you. This is a repeated game. The routers repeatedly sending packets, not one packet and then they're done. Similarly for you and driving, if you leave Far, far, away, far away from where you work, then every morning you get in your car and drive there. That also is a repeated game. You figure out what is the right way to get there. Uh, I guess that the particular results is go, are going to about this uh, queuing system, which is meant to be a very, very simplified version, but they may be incorporating more realistic features than what we had on the package routing in the, work on packet routing, assume that congestion causes delays, that is there are more cars there, it's, it's slower to get across, um, but it is making some assumptions, for example, in true packet routing, packets get dropped and have to get resent and that's not in this model. So uh, in the um, queuing system app application, I actually focus on that part and say, what if, you know, there is this package they get to send to the servers. If the server can't serve it, the server instantly drops the packet and you're gonna to have to resend it. So that's going to be the model, but I'll come back to this in a second. And I guess maybe the killer application on which unfortunately I can't present results yet, or it would be nice to have results, uh, one that our, our uh, Google or internet industry wants is repeated auction. That too is a repeated game. Uh, advertisers repeatedly bid on getting shown on the web. That is a repeated game. Um, so you can ask what, what, is an, what should I expect as an outcome of such a repeated game? Um, I'm going to focus on the assumption that the players are learning. They're using some sort of machine learning algorithm to figure out what to do. Uh, that is, they, they use data that's available to them to adapt to the learning situation. And I guess here are the questions uh, that one would naturally ask. It's generally reasonable to ask what kind of information is available to the players. I'm not going to focus on this. I can tell you that the kind of results I'm presenting is, a, is possible to do, learn, learn enough. There's very minimal information about what they learn. If we give them more information, they might be able to learn faster. And mostly we'll focus on this question, what learning properties would, would guarantee okay social welfare. Um, so what do I mean, what do the, so the, uh, for those of you who, especially from our program would think that this is also ancient history and for the last say 15 years or something close to 10 to 15 years, there have been a lot of results on uh, what's called no regret learning. And here is what no regret learning is trying to do. So if I take, the Nash equilibrium, uh, one early hope would be that as you learn, everyone converges to a stable outcome, which would be a Nash equilibrium. What does a stable outcome mean? They play some sort of strategies. I guess A1 to AN is the strategy that player one through N is playing here at time one, then they time two, time three. Eventually they settle on something and then just repeat it. And they seem happy to repeat that thing. Why would they be happy to repeat it? because if it satisfies this condition, which is the Nash condition, and maybe int introducing the notation here. So this is cost that player I played if they played the vector of all A's, these are the unindexed A's or super index A's, uh, it's lesser cost than anything else this person can do, given that everyone else is staying with this strategy. That's the Nash equilibrium. It's, it, my, my strategy AI is best response to what everyone else is doing, which is this A minus I, everyone except for me. That's called the no regret condition. And that's the Nash equilibrium. Uh, and what the no regret learning algorithm, which sometimes also goes under the name of Hanan consistent would be, is to get rid of the 
oops, sorry, get rid of the assumption here that they found a stable solution, but keep this, which in particular means something like this, that they do something, who knows, it might not have gotten stable or probably it didn't get stable. But if I take uh, whatever cost they're playing, it's less than any fixed strategy with hindsight. There isn't a strategy X that they feel bad about, or to be very more precise, because there is an upfront part where they're doing the learning, they might have made mistakes upfront, but the cost they're playing over time is better than had they played this fixed strategy X over time. Okay, that's the goal. And this is, a, as it turns out, and I'll say a couple more uh, words about this in a minute, this is a very algorithmically achievable strategy, but it's trying, or, or goal, but it's trying to say that if this fails, that is the opposite inequality is true, then there is a strategy X that is so much better than what you're doing. Please wake up to this fact. It's so, you know, you're driving to work and for whatever dumb reason, you're driving around the earth in the wrong direction. There is the right direction. It's always very fast. Why didn't you try it? And the way these algorithms work is maybe better if I admit to you, so many simple rules assure, assure this, but to actually foreshadow where I'm heading, um, this is really what we're doing. And this is a bit more complex notation that I want to put in in a second. Um, in actually often interaction, the cost you're paying is not only dependent on what you did this very second, but also what happened yesterday or the day before, or it depends on the history. So in a better notation, this is the cost over time that you play a right place at time t but not only depending on what happened at time t, but also what happened in all the previous time periods. So this one semicolon t is like the whole history. So this is what he's playing at time t, given the history. And what, what these algorithms achieve is that it's that cost is no worse or better than what would have happened if you kept the history, but every now and then tried this X strategy as an experiment. And this sort of also tells you again, a little bit of error. This is just the error term. Uh, this is you know, foreshadowing you or telling you how these algorithms achieve it. it they often refer to as explore exploit. What they're doing is every now and then testing X. And if X is very good when you test it, well, then I guess you should do that. X is not very good when you test it, then you should back off. So they're trying this sort of you know, switch off to X every now and then. And this is the guarantee they achieve. Uh, again, they achieve it with this explore exploit kind of uh, strategy. There are lots and lots of algorithms going back to even earlier than the ones I listing here. The two I list are both sort of maybe simpler and uh, maybe my favorites. Um, and I guess one thing I like pointing out that this assumption that people achieve this condition is weaker then another commonly used condition in the econ, econ CS literature that they reach an Nash equilibrium. If they were to reach an Nash equilibrium, that is, if they reach a stable outcome in which they're happy, they obviously satisfies that condition. So it's a weaker condition, it's algorithmically achievable, unlike the Nash equilibrium that has uh, PPAD completeness results that I didn't list here, but I guess we all know. Um, so what I like to think, what I maybe used to like thinking about and which I'm going to criticize in about 10 seconds is I like this no regret condition, but at the same time, there are some handicaps. So why, I will tell you first why I like the condition and I tell you why one doesn't like the condition because every coin has two sides. This one certainly does. So what's good about the no regret condition? So I don't want to think about I want to think about it as a behavioral model. And I want to claim that this is not a bad behavioral model. And I guess one way to try to prove it to you is to look at data and see do people actually achieve this model. So there's a huge bunch of papers at this point um, thinking about whether it's true or not true. Uh, large number of them, including one that I'm a co-author of here, uh, was trying to say, yes, yes, no regret condition is players as they repeatedly play games, they achieve this condition. Um, two of those 
our lab experiments and the one that uh, that that is joined with um, Dennis who who I think at the end didn't come but was supposed to be in this program and uh, Vasily who's the main organizer despite uh, Peter giving me some credit for this um, we're looking at Bing data advertisement data on Microsoft auctions and our basic all of these papers basic finding is that reasonably true so our reasonably true is within five to ten percent it's not the error is not tiny but you know single digit percentage um these guys uh, uh nissan and naughty say that you know if i give a really shitty game to someone where it's truly frustrating to play those people don't satisfy the no regret condition it's just too frustrating but most of them do uh and i guess this is this is really positive uh there are some papers that say that it's not getting satisfied this is one of my favorites in the negative category um, who again is a lab experiment a seller buyer game and the thing they're pointing out that humans are uh, recency biased uh, they're not sufficiently react on long histories if recently something was good for you they jump to conclusions too fast this is a property that i totally believe humans have and actually for us it's probably reasonable if you driving and you know this month you discover that certain highway is not is not jammed who cares that last year it was jammed that doesn't matter so recency bias is something that probably we should be recency biased but the point is that if they don't fully satisfy the no regret condition because they play to the recency biased and then we have a paper here again with dennis and a student of mine uh which where our conclusion is that people don't satisfy it and here this is Zillow um, ag uh, agents advertising on Zillow which Zillow actually stopped uh, for literally the reason that these are real estate agents bidding is not they think it was too complicated for them I think in any event Zillow stopped the bidding system and they're right it just there wasn't there wasn't enough attention paid to it and they really uh i don't know what they value for it was for the ad but there's no value on which they satisfy the rule so they clearly were too complex for them uh so again on the yeah uh, would you like to elaborate a little bit more about what do you mean that uh, in the case of uh fellow of sergani's work it was it wasn't true. It, uh, you, you said it's true. Like, just the error is a lot. Like, what, what, what do you mean with so that? So I get this one. Yes, yes. So we're looking at big data. Uh, we actually made it easy on us, as in looked at agents that have very large budgets. This is actually will be clear in a minute of why that was important, because if you have very large budgets, then you're doing a linear optimization. You're supposed to bid um somehow depending on your value for for showing the ad um maximizing your net utility that is the value minus the cost you paid for it that's what you're optimizing which is a easier objective function than if you have a budget that limits you so these are all advertisements these very high budgets so they're just advertising the they what they're optimizing or what they should be optimizing is the value they get minus the price i don't actually know what the value is but I can tell you that each of them had a value under which their behavior was rational. So it's reasonable to believe that that's probably their value and they did the right thing. This is as opposed to done here in the Zillow case, where um, again, we tried to look at bidders that use large budgets. So budget wasn't the limiting thing, but there is no value on which their behavior was rational. So they were rational. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yes, yes, great so, idea. Um, you said earlier the no regret is a weaker notion than Nash equilibrium. I'm curious if there's any relationship between that and self confirming equilibrium that Fudenberg and Levine did in the early 90s. I don't know if anyone looked at that. Um, 
So I guess the point is that this this is not an or it's a correlated equilibrium, but it's not a stable equilibrium constant. So what I'm giving up on is the stability. And if you look at which I guess we I don't have in this talk, but the full talk we gave on we used to give on the on the paper with Dennis and, and Russelli. Uh, we usually oh, talking got, specifically about that. We thing. usually show data for the Microsoft uh, big ads where it's very clear they're not reaching an equilibrium. Mm -hmm. That is, people, my guess is that they're using a, a gradient descent style learning algorithm that they pushing the bit up and then they push it down and it goes in, it seems to go in waves, but they're not stabilizing. Um, and you can ask why they're not stabilizing, which is an excellent question. But one reason they're not stabilizing because learning algorithms do not lead to a stable outcome. They exactly lead to this baby behavior, but yet it satisfies this condition. Um, why could they satisfy this condition? You can say because the condition is weak. A single strategy is hindsight. When, when, when the other guy is going up, I should have been low, and when he's going down, I should have been high. But that's not, I'm asking, I'm not asking you for something that complicated. I'm asking you for something simple. A single strategy is hindsight. And that's achievable. These algorithms do achieve it, but they don't stabilize. So it's 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 a different relaxation than Nash and the the film works in. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. So I like it as a there are many good algorithms, and there is a lot of work happening in our program of people trying to find better algorithms or algorithms for cases where we didn't have algorithms. I really like this as a, as a behavioral model that is not assuming that they ran a particular named algorithm, but instead taking a condition and say, there are many algorithms, I don't care which one they ran, as long as they satisfy that condition, that's my behavioral model. And I like this line here is that all I'm asking that is that it's a very simple thing. It's a consistently good strategy. Please don't well, wake up to this. That's all I'm asking. Um, and then in particular, I like it because I'm a theoretician as many of the people or maybe all of us here to some more or less extent are. And it's a condition that's nice to use in theory. So that's what I like about it. Um, there are many positive results, which I'm going to only flash here and not actually uh, elaborate on them. So price of energy was originally defined by Kutsupias and Papa Dimitriou, and it meant it, it considered Nash equilibria, and this was the definition. You looked at you the game, the cost or utility achieved compared to an optimum cost. Um, and then in a sequence of papers, which again, I said it's 15 or plus years ago, maybe more than that by now, uh, was extended to this no-regular learning outcomes with the obvious definition, that is the utility or cost these people achieve as they play the game. So summed over all the agents, summed over all the time, utility of everyone compared to the optimum. If you played for capital T times, then I guess you can just repeat the same thing and the optimum went up by a factor of T. And I guess the main message is that all these proofs that we had, um, you know, now, 20 somewhat years ago uh, on the price of energy, or almost all of them extend to no regret learning outcomes. And that was really a nice, uh, originally started by a paper, actually the whole using it as a behavior condition was started by an Avram Blom, Hagiaditi, Ligat and Ross paper. Uh, and then uh, the observation that all our results extend to this was a paper by Rough Garden a year, year later. And there are really lots and lots of results. Like I feel the slide visit, there are many more. Um, that's not what I'm going to talk about because this was the sort of, sort of the background here. Um, I, I promise that I'm also going to admit that some things is wrong with no regret learning. And here are a few things that are wrong, one of which I'm going to focus on. Uh, for the time I have. Uh, so limitations, um, there are nice papers, including by some participants around here, that it's too much, like it's actually too hard to learn. No regret depends on what the game is. Certainly many settings is too much to expect. Uh, there are also interesting results in the auction setting that definitely the standard no regret algorithms are super dumb to, 
play. That is, you can take advantage of the players if they do that and extract all the money from them. So it's a dumb thing to do. I'm going to focus on this one that in some settings where it's doable, but it doesn't seem strong enough. And I'm hoping that there are better condition that maybe shares the properties of the um, of, of what we had about no regret learning. And these are the two conditions I would like to have. I want to have a more general condition that also is usually true in data. That is, people do do that and implies better outcomes. Yes. First of all, the too much to expect is a hardness result. Yes, these are hardness results. Yeah, just, just to be sure that I have got the point of the difference here, the higher inequality they see is the classical no regret notion, yeah. while the lower one is something that you propose as a refinement no, of the. No, regret. actually, this is so. Uh, maybe I'll come back. Let me come back to your point in a second point. about the differences and I'll, I'll page back to this slide and check if it's clear enough and try to answer your question. So one critical assumption in all this work, which I didn't emphasize and I want to say it before I, I respond to your question is that every time you repeat the game, you're playing a, a whole new copy of the game. Um, that is the only thing that carries from one round to the next is what you learned from the previous round and not anything about the game. The game is not changing. And one question to ask, is this a reasonable assumption? And I propose the answer is of course not. And I guess to sort of make the extremes, if we talk about the morning rush hour, then the assumption is that no matter how bad traffic is Monday morning, everyone went home by Tuesday. It's a new, the roads are empty in the middle of the night, they're empty enough, and you can start again on Tuesday. But if you think about second by second traffic and either cars or packets, then it's not true. If you had trouble in second number 17, then second number 18, the very same packets are still there and struggling. So then it's not true. And this is an assumption that when you pay a new copy of the game is a fresh new copy with no carryover effect, whether there is a carryover effect is the main question I want to ask. Um, and I'm claiming that this whole price of energy is not as well understood if there is a carryover effect. In fact, it's very not understood if there is a carryover effect. Now, this is the moment I want to go back to trying to answer your Question, uh, that notation up there is implicitly, this is the classical notion of, of no regret, is implicitly or maybe explicitly in the notation is assuming no carryover effect. It says that the cost you're playing or cost you, you pay at iteration T has no direct effect of what happened in iteration one through T minus one. The cost is simply depends on what you did at iteration T and the previous thing, you know, except for your choice of strategy, it has no effect. Uh, in this notation that I done here, have done here, I actually admitted that, wait, wait, it could have an effect. Your cost at iteration T can implicitly depend on, or not explicitly depend on what happened in previous iteration because there are packets left or something. And in that notation, what I gave you is what these algorithms actually achieve. If there is a carryover effect, I can still run a classical no regret algorithm. It's an algorithm, I can follow the algorithm. But what they achieve is not that condition, which no longer has a meaning because there is the carryover effect, but this is the condition it achieves. Which you can maybe believe me that that's what it will achieve because these are all explore, exploit algorithms. They try things and they stick with the things that's good. And what this notation says that the cost of X, had you consistently always tried it, but somehow went with the previous history. This is the explore part. You didn't stick play X all the time, but you just tested it. And was it good when you tested it? Yeah. So I, I think there are two questions. The first one is, I want to understand from theoretical perspective, I'm trying to make a model in my mind. The third one is if uh, the actions that I play, uh, we are in a multi agent or a single agent? Uh, multiple agent, oh, but okay. everyone's separate. Okay. So it's not it, a single learner, but 
Every agent has yeah. its own learning algorithm. So if all of us, we define, I, I was thinking initially the model where I'm playing to a convex online convex optimization uh, that is changing in every round, but there is somehow a budget about how much one game differs from the other. Because in the example of the parking, for example, it's not that the next game that I will see is very, very different from the third one. So the first question is how much the, the, the games differ because, and now is the second uh, uh, thread of question that if they differ a lot, then we do not speak about the stochastic game, uh, about the Markov uh, and MDB game where we play and our actions uh, define somehow uh, yeah. so a random. These are all great questions in a much more general setting. Concretely, our results are in a very concrete setting with packets where I can tell you in a minute what the game is and how, how little the change is. But I would love to generalize it in the direction you, you're going with sort of more abstractly defining. And indeed, anything can only, or I'm thinking anything we do can only extend if the change between iterations is sufficiently small. Again, results are but one concrete setting, but I'm hoping that with a limit like something along the lines that you suggest is just limiting the change between iterations something this might work maybe a basic question right what is the quantification on the other players actions is it for all a minus it that's true or there exists one or it depends on so at the moment i'm just telling you what is it that a classical norget algorithms achieve you know, it ran your favorite Norget algorithm, multiplicative weight, follow the perturbed leader, your choice. This is what they achieve. They're against the worst case adversary. The results so the worst will, case A minus IT is arbitrary. Is because the algorithms are strong, they go against the a worst case adversary. When I switch, which I'll do in a minute, on what I can say about the games, I'm going to make the much better assumption that everyone is doing this learning thing. Not, they're not worse. The adversary is not worse case. They too are doing no regret learning. Right? But no regret learning is strong. At least these algorithms are. They can achieve. They can achieve this condition against worst case adversaries. I can also comment on that. I think that um, again, looking at the data, uh, Vasily just showed up a second ago, but I don't see him anymore. Oh, there he is. Uh, Vasily might know more about the data than I do, but our take was that what they're doing is gradient descent and not the Norigat algorithms. And they achieve the Norigat condition because the data is not worst case. Okay, uh, so here is what I, again, um, going back to where I was. Yeah. One quick question. Just because you, you said it again and again, uh, you don't mean something like, uh, the online gradient descent method I have it in my mind as a, an FTRL method with a L2 regularizer, but you don't mean that with gradient descent because every time that you say they do not apply a no regret and they apply a gradient descent. They so seem gradient. to be running a deterministic algorithm. Ah, okay, okay. The, uh, okay. They seem to be doing something very okay. that, that, that was the point. Which it fails to have, you know, deterministic algorithms won't guarantee. Okay, fine. But if the, if the environment sufficiently random, then they work okay. I think that's what's happening there. I see. Okay, so uh, again, I claim that this carryover effect life is much less understood. Um, and I guess what I'm going to ask is a question I generally like is in the skewing system. Uh, I can tell you how much capacity is needed to centrally schedule every, every packet to get to their destination. I'm asking if I give you enough extra capacity, would learning do it? Is it good enough? Um, and the main point, which I'm hoping to still get to uh, is, which I maybe will skip some of the proof slides to make sure I get there, is, is no regret the right notion of learning. And in fact, I've been trying to drive you towards that hmm, there are some issues here, which maybe you can guess at this point, but I definitely want to show you the example. So this, Sorry. yeah. Say something about what extra capacity means. This may be something. Yes, one it. tiny, no, no one knows it. At one tiny second, here is the model. Right. So here is the actual simple model that our results are about. There are these queues that are going to get packets. Packets will arrive at, um, you know, um, Bernoulli every iteration, every period with some probability lambda i get the new packet shows up here. 
the SKUs will decide which server they want to try to send the packets to. The servers can have service rates, that is some probability they succeed at serving a packet. Um, you send a bunch of packets, then you know there's some collision here. I'm going to assume that one of them gets through and the other one gets sent back. And sometimes servers can fail also. Uh, servers, uh, the queues can only send one packet at one place at a time, and the packets, the servers can only serve one packet at a time. These are the critical assumptions. So as a learner, and these are guys are the learners here, there are two things you have to learn, which, which are the good, good servers and which are the bad servers, but also where are other people sending their packets so you don't have collisions. So there's a game here. The second part is the game. That is- So you learn more than just the probability of success. Exactly, you learn what, where, where are you succeeding? The amount of feedback I'm currently assuming is just whether you succeeded or not. If your packet came back, you didn't succeed. Otherwise, you did. I don't need you to know whether you succeeded because it was a bad server or you failed because someone else got through. It doesn't matter to me, but maybe it would help if I give them more information. Yeah. So the queues have different players here? Yeah. So these guys are different players that are each trying to learn where to send their packets. And just to be sure, symbolically, uh, the server will send back to the initial queue a packet. Yes. No, 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 to... yes. So, so if you want to be a bit more realistic for packet writing, what really might happen that the packet gets dropped and you get a message that your packet got dropped and then you have to resend it, which is mathematically the same as sending the packet back. Uh, where I'm cheating is that in reality, the servers usually have a tiny buffer and I'm not modeling the buffer. So what really happens is that up to two or three, it buffers it and then drops. And I'm just assuming you drop it right away. Is something different from uh, unserved sending back and the failure? Uh, no, uh, no, no. We, it's just, just, it, it, the it's pragmatic and the, the third. I'm just pointing out that this is what the, what the game, game theory aspect is. Oh, this yeah. is a collision and you're avoiding the collision. The right way to get served, if I were coordinating it is you know, <laughs> sending one bucket at a time everywhere. That would be the coordinated action. And the players are only the queues or also the servers? No, at the moment, only the, only the servers, only the queues are the players. Okay. I'm making one very critical assumption. Down here, you have to wonder if there's a collision, which one of them am I serving? I'm going to make assume that, assume that the packets are timestamped and the oldest one gets served. This is really helpful, and I guess I can try to convince you that without this, nothing good will happen. But if, if the servers try to serve the oldest packet, packets, then there is a hope that things can get through. So that's the all. Good moment to ask questions. Uh, and I can tell you in a minute. So, yeah. so this last assumption, um, if I understand it correctly, it means that uh, well, it's a probability zero event that two players would send packets at the exact same moment. No, no. Okay, uh, this the, the time time is slotted. Okay. Um, period one, period two. Uh, if I want a continuous time model, I have to declare conflict to be, you know, if you're too close to each other, that's a conflict, which we didn't work at. So we just assume time is slotted. Okay. Excellent question. So it's, it's synchronous and that it's synchronous. They all okay. they. That iteration T, they all decide to do something and then they go. Excellent question. Thank you for asking. So they are synchronous in the way that they send, but we have to give them one random tiebreaker uh, priority in the stamps or the timestamps. Oh, I don't, yeah, yeah, for example, okay. I don't care what happens if the stamps are identical. Okay. What will matter is what happens when the stamps are sufficiently far apart. Um, to give you any results, I have to start by giving you a sort of baseline measure that if I were to coordinate, uh, what would be reasonable? And this one, I hope you're just going to believe me that that's the condition. So for a baseline measure, I can assume that everything is sorted, so just so it's easy to refer to them. So uh, the queues are and the order on which highest arrival, lowest arrival, and the same on the servers. And I claim this is the condition that is for the top, uh, the best server should have enough capacity to serve the highest arriving queue. You know, everyone can only send to one place at a time. 
So if you know his his packets arriving faster than even the best server, life is hopeless, even if he was alone. Uh, similarly, if I take the top two servers, top two queues, they together can can try two servers. There should be enough capacity there, or else life is hopeless, and so on all the way down. So for every k, if I take the top k, the highest arriving top k packets, and maybe the best serving top k servers, then then there should be more capacity here than there. Yeah. Does this require the oldest piece of? Uh, no, this doesn't no, require right? nothing. This is coordinate. If I coordinate, then nothing is needed. So this is the condition. It's not very hard to prove, and. At least, hopefully, I convince you that it's necessary, even if I didn't convince you that it's sufficient. But if you coordinate, you can do this. Yeah. This picture was leading me to think that there was some kind of graph structure, but you're saying any queue can send to any Yeah, server. any queue can send to any server. It would be nice to add a graph structure here. So here are the two theorems that I will not actually prove, given that you guys were really, really nice and asked lots of cool questions, but instead just tell you about. So if everyone, every, uh, every Q is an OREGRAT learner that is satisfies the OREGRAT condition, and I have twice as much capacity as needed. So instead of having this condition, which was the necessary condition, I have it with a factor of two extra, then OREGRAT learning is good enough. Um, on the other hand, if Qs are actually better, and this I definitely will show you, not necessarily the proof, but the reason for this, that the they that no that turns out to be too myopic and if the servers are more patient in how they learn then i don't need the factor of two i need a little bit less it's not a giant factor up but it shows that something is like that no regret was not the wrong condition now given that i have uh only a few minutes uh what i'm going to do is maybe tell you something about um just a one sentence of what this proof was like. I don't know if that would make you believe the proof or not, but maybe since I have the slides, I will at least have to flip through them anyhow. Uh, but most importantly, I wanna show you the example that shows the difference between the two, because I think that's the most interesting part here. So what's the, the proof for the first one was a potential function proof. And what I wanna argue is that there is a potential function, which is the time steps of all the packets, which satisfies a very nice random process theorem by Pimentel and Rosenthal. Uh, one is supposed to prove that is, so this is all the time stamps of all the packets I have, which is what this potential function sum up all the time stamps. So I have a packet which is seven steps old and one is 20 steps old, I just add them all up. That's my potential function and but uh, we need to prove that if this potential function has a what's called negative drift. So when it's high enough, it's expected to go down. Uh, that's good enough to prove that the potential function will stay low the whole time or in or this high probability will stay, low, stay, stay low and expectations stay low the whole time. Uh, and that's basically the proof. So I have to argue that when um, there's a lot of old packets in the system, or at least one packet that's super old or some combination of those, then that potential function is expected to go down. And that's the proof. Uh, and I guess due to lack of time, I'm going to still cheat here and not actually show you either the proof or the extra technical details, but instead show you the example of what's the difference between these two guys and maybe depending on our patients and questions, maybe give you something about the proof of the lower one. So here is my favorite example from this talk that shows you what's wrong with no regret learning. So here is a simple example of my setup. So there are two um, cues here. This is arrival rate a little bit above half, and this is also an arrival rate a little bit above half. So roughly speaking, both of those cues get a new packet every you know, second time, a bit more than that. And we have two servers, a literally perfect guy that serves someone all the time, and a kind of not so good one, less than 50% of the time. And I claim that the unique no regret strategy is to send all your packets to the top. It's the only thing you can do if you insist on no regret, right? Because these are identical queues and they're going to, you know, uh, 
split the traffic identically, like 50-50. So they get served at a 50% rate, which by the way is not enough because they get packets a bit more than 50%. So they're gonna build up an infinite queue behind them. That's unfortunate, but 50% is better than 47%. So they have no regret. Strategy? I mean, wouldn't any smarter strategy also not have regret? Nope. If you start sending anything done there, you have regret. Why do you have regret? Because whenever you send it here, you only get served 50, 47% of the time. This is a pretty shitty server here. Over there, you got 50%. That was better. You should go over there. It's not socially efficient, but it's. Yeah. It's not socially efficient, but the only thing to do is not regret is to send every one of your packets on there. Again, every time you send down here, you guarantee yourself no worse, no better than 47% for sure. And up there, you were getting 50%. 50 is more than 47. Why would you do this? But the answer is because you should. It's not only socially efficient, it's actually selfishly good. So what happens if someone actually does do, do what I suggested? Which, by the way, these are the right numbers. This is the national. This is a. Uh, self, uh, mesh equilibrium strategy, but what's on the board. That is 10% down here, 90% here, and the other guy sending there, that's Nash. Uh, it helps, it looks like this is actually a, a, a way to help your body. Because, you know, 10% of the time you're done here and he's alone, so he gets service. But what really happens is his packets are less old than yours because he has this 10% advantage. So whenever you go up, you're very likely to have an advantage. So you are, when you go up, you get way more than 50%. Remember the timestamps? You're older. You probably get served here. So according to our no regret rule, you have an even bigger regret now. You don't have 50% chance of getting served here. You're like 60 or 65% chance of getting served. But that's happening because you came down sometimes. If you don't do this, then it's 50-50. So if I go back to what we used to have, then you get 50-50. If you do this, then you get even better up there. And actually, both of you get across. And there is enough capacity here to get everyone served. Yeah. Uh, so this will be true. What are the numbers here? Uh, that you 10% and 90%. Point nine 10% and to go down and 90%. 90%. So you say. Let's say that the ten percent I will send them to the city one. Uh, the uh, with high probability I will get it back. Uh, well, you know, right. fifty seven, fifty three percent probability. Uh, well, then, zero point zero four seven probability that I will get it back. Is it right? Is so this is forty seven percent success rate. So fifty three percent. Ah, yeah, right. Back. Right. Additional incentive. Additional incentive. Yeah. And I will get it back. And that means that I will keep, I want to be sure about the model. I will keep it. And in the next round, I will send it again with probability 10% down and 9% up. Yeah. And then you say that the, because it has timestamp from the previous round, they are You're older. So when you go up, you will have priority. I see. So what's happening here? is that if you imagine a situation where lots of packets build up, remember I wrote proof that I cared about when the timestamps, some of timestamps is very big. So there are lots of packets in the system. Then I'm fully utilizing this server, which we know it doesn't have enough capacity. It's only one as opposed to 1.2. But I little bit use this, that adds enough capacity that I actually get through. Whereas without this link here, you not have enough capacity. That just like that's not enough capacity up there. So what's really happening from a learning perspective point of view, at least I think, is that regret is the wrong notion. This instantaneous explore exploit in a place where there's carryover effect. You should stick to what you want to do and try it for longer to see if it has a long term effect. So that's maybe what I'm going to end. The timestamp is playing an important role. Yes, timestamp plays an important role. So a quick question. Sorry. Yeah. So do people do mixed strategies here or you allow? Yeah, I'm allowing mixed strategies. So this is sort of the learning difference I want to emphasize. This is what Norigat learning algorithms actually achieve in a carryover thing. This is something I tried to say in the beginning, that is, or throughout 
is because things depend on the history, this is the you know instantaneous success when you explore things and you you measure the instantaneous effects of exploring things. What you should be doing is more like this. What's the long-term effect of trying this next thing? And maybe this is too extreme, like you can't you know, try everything, but instead of trying it once, you should try it and stick to it for a while and see if it's having, a, having an effect as you stick to it. That's what we probably should need. And in a place with carryover effect, I even believe that something like this, this is again too strong, but something like this might actually be true that people are doing it. They're trying things not instantaneously. I don't know for sure. Um, and I guess where that uh, point six three result come from is assuming something more uh, uh, in the queuing game. I'm going to actually uh, maybe end with just showing you the worst case example where the number of the six point six three came from. This is the worst case equilibrium in the other in this in this more patient game. Uh, turn out if which you maybe again will totally believe me, if every single server has equal rate and they uniformly randomizing, which is always the stupid equilibrium, like they, you know, like boss and beans, they uniformly choose one of them at random. Uh, that's where the, the, the 0.63 is actually e, uh, e minus one over E. That's where the number came from. And what's happening here is that because they, that's such a symmetric strategy, but that's of course Nash. Uh, and unfortunately, one over E probably to one of the servers goes unused, which is the wasted space. And, and, uh, so I guess I love that you guys asked so many questions, but as a result, you don't get to see so much hint of the proof. Uh, but instead, I will just end this. Oops, sorry. Let's go. Let's take it back. Uh, a couple of conclusions. The one I more talked about and that I sort of want to think more about my research direction. So I guess in the first statement was that even if they do learning, even in carryover, but sometimes even no regret learning is good enough. Uh, but no regret learning is, seems too simplistic. And I guess I would love to understand better what form of this sort of more patient learning can one get maybe stronger results with? Uh, there are many other beautiful questions in learning in games that I always wanted to explore, and I don't have very good um, theoretical results supporting it. But learning seems like an excellent way to adapt to a possibly badly playing opponent, unlike Nash. Like, you know, I should do better if the opponent's not playing well. Uh, it doesn't need a common prior, so they don't have to know who the opponent opponent says they can just learn. Um, and I guess if, if, if this is the sort of recency bias, it can possibly adopt to changing environments if they don't change fast enough. And I'm going to stop here and thank you very much for listening. All right, got time for one or two quick questions, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I'm curious if there is um, a characterization of uh, the stationary outcome in the long run. For example, the stationary distribution of the Q lens or expected waiting time or throughput of the system. Uh, those are all great questions. And no, I don't have results. Actually, this whole queuing model, uh, queuing system model, I learned or thought originally about a paper in. NIPS 16, when it was still called NIPS and not NURIX, uh, where uh, the paper was talking about someone doing a single queue, doing no regret learning, just trying to learn which are the good servers. So it's a, exactly this model, except they're not multiple computing servers, but just one, one queue. And the whole thing they have to learn is which are the good servers. And they have very precise results, exactly of the kind. Um, that you're suggesting for a single server with no regret. No, so multiple servers, single queue. Okay, single. So what the queue, what the server has, what the queue has to learn is which is the good server, mm -hmm. and not very surprisingly, the same condition. Like in in order to get across, they need one of the servers to be good enough. Mm -hmm. So what should happen is that 
the queue lengths behind you grows up because you initially don't know and you keep getting your packets rejected and eventually you figure out which one is the better server and then your queue length goes down. And they have very nice exact characterization, goes up to log something and then back down. So they have exactly what you want, except there's no competing players. I wish I could do this for competing players also at the moment. But maybe one more. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Eva. Um, so uh, I was wondering about the second bullet there, the second blue bullet, uh, blue bullet, the second blue bullet. Oh, that one. Yeah. Uh, so the types of environments you think about are uh, can be modeled in the language of multi-agent reinforcement learning, right? So there's a state and people make art and so on and so forth. And you're interested in sort of like some policy uh, regret. Yeah. Where, uh, so, uh, you know, one one viewpoint to look at uh, this bullet is to say, okay, like develop methods for some, you know, for general multi-agent RL, but is, is there some uh, kind of like special case of this problem or? Uh, uh, Not so sure. So one, ben, so I guess one proposal here, which at least if you, you know, uh, a reasonable guess and certainly was my first guess, that, oh, we have an algorithm, we have policy regret. If I make them play no policy regret instead of no regret, that will be good enough. So what's policy regret? As an algorithm, it does exactly what I hoped it would do. That is, instead of trying the new alternate policy X one time and then jumping away, it tries it for one period. If that didn't work, maybe it tries things for two periods, then for four periods and like longer and longer periods. And then it achieves a guarantee sort of like, what we want. Uh, as it turns out, by a follow-up paper uh, points out that policy regret as a behavior property is not strong enough. That is the same factor of two band uh, is still in a really convoluted, awkward choreographed dance between the players. They can fail to get the packet through even though they have policy, no policy regret. Uh, I'm very suspicious that if they actually run the no policy regret algorithm, they would do okay. This is a stupid, like, there are a bunch of results out there in the classical old world without the carryover effect, when you say that no regret is not strong enough. And usually what they'll say is that you do a awkward choreograph dance, uh, which does satisfy the no regret property, but it's a really unnatural thing to do and that fails to achieve the property. And there's a copy of that result in, in our case. That is a exact same lower band, the factor of two lower band, where the players have the, the, uh, have the policy regret property, but they do something super crazy and choreographed, like every, you know, as a, as a prescribed sequence. It's, it does have the property of, of having the policy regret but it's not something you would reach in a natural algorithm. So, so to be clear, your requirement is not uh, no policy regret? No, like the, my, my the requirement I mean, that you would like? I mean, what the results we have is only about uh, stationary equilibrium. That is if if they reach a Nash equilibrium, I can page back to The point 0.63. This point 0.63 is only an equilibrium. Equilibrium, I see. So and for we get it via equilibrium oh, analysis. I would okay. like to get that via learning. Uh -huh. At some point, I hope that I know the condition, it should be policy regret, and now I know that's not true. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So I either need a different condition or possibly something about how this policy regret algorithm work. The, the counter example is a really, really unnatural sequence of steps, which does have the policy regret, but it's not working. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. So, we, you, you know, some. But these algorithms reach are more natural no regret conditions than than sort of the worst case no regret conditions are really crazy. Okay. Right, we might take the other okay. questions offline. Please sure. join Happy me in to. thanking Ava for a fascinating talk. Thank you. Thank you for asking so many questions. That was really.